Acts chapter 7. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Charon. And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall shew thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him not inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. After that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. And delivered him out of all his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. And there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt, and Canaan, and great affliction. And our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Sychem, and laid in the sepulcher of, that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Sychem. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dwelt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young to the end that they might not live. In which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was full forty years, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him, and avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? And he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. And when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then most, Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord unto him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt." This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? 
The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in a bush. He brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses was said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness, which the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them. And in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned. And gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them with, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. When he had said this, he fell asleep. The title of the message today is Challenge Accepted. Challenge Accepted. If you were to look back in the previous chapter there, chapter 6, beginning in verse 7, the Bible reads, And the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. They were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spake. Then they summoned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came unto him and caught him and brought him to the council. And set up false witnesses which said, This man see us not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that 
This Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered unto us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. So here Stephen is described as being one full of the Holy Ghost, full of the power of God on high because he had faith and he was given great wonders to show forth. People even seeing him as his face had been the face of an angel before them. But yet they brought up and suburban men to rise against the word of God that was, be, that was spoken, to contradict it and to, to make like the preaching was blasphemous and, and wrong and wicked. Regardless, verse 10 says they were not able to resist the spirit. And even their charge that he was speaking against Moses is, is false because you even read the context of, of his, his sermon that follows after this. And the man was, was speaking right things about the law and right things about Moses and encouraging the people in that direction and speaking only highly of the saints of old. This was a really great and agreeable and wonderful message to the ears of the Jews. As it comes through, they hear about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the, the tabernacle and all those things were very familiar to them. This message is almost a, a synopsis of the entirety of the Old Testament, of which they were very familiar, of which many had memorized it. They, 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 they said they loved this book, writing it all over their doorposts and wearing it over their heads and, and, uh, and, and frontlets between their eyes. And, and they said they loved the law of God. But when the message got to verse 51... It took a turn where it was once not offensive. It was just simply telling the Old Testament story. It was a topical message. A sermon that most at the time would enjoy. Just, just talking about the patriarchs and talking about the saints of old. But then verse 51 enters application and challenge. And enters the, the preaching really starts hitting home. He, he outlined you know, the whole story that he was trying to, to portray them to set the context, to set the stage for, for what happened in verse 51. And that was application, challenge, hard preaching. Now most enjoy the topical preaching of God's word. You know, the, the various thoughts that, that carry through scriptures, the, the, the themes, the ideas that you can draw from just, just the plain context. The Bible stories, right? We would teach them to little kids, all, all the great stories of old. Nobody seems to... Get offended by that. Even expository preaching, where you, where you take the Bible and you simply say, okay, well, this is what, what it means. This, this, is, this, this is what you can pull out of it, just, just in a plain, immediate context. The, this is what the Bible is saying. This is what the Bible is, is meaning. But, you know, and I'll even say this. Even a lot of people, especially in our groups, they, they love hard preaching. They love, they love when, when somebody gets up there and they're yelling and hollering, even something like what Stephen did. said, eat stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart, right? This hard preach. They love that. Amen. Until it applies to us. Now. Now it's cut personally. But now I'm offended. Well, is he talking about me? What in the world? So they're all listening to this sermon. They're like, great, wonderful, amen. This is good. I love this. I, you know, I'm learning about Solomon building the temple. I'm learning how they got there. This is awesome. Then he says, he's stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard in ears. What's he talking about? As he's leaning over the podium and pointing at him, right? You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. And now suddenly they're offended. They're cut personally. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. They're, they're verbalizing their anger. Who are you talking about? Don't you know who I am? Verse 57, then they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with, with one accord. Can you imagine this? The preacher's up there, and he's, he's preaching a message, and everyone's like, yeah, good, amen. I like this. And then he turns it, and now he's talking about them particularly. Ye, stiff necked Ye, uncircumcised. They, they start yelling. They start, they start gnashing with their teeth until eventually, eventually they're charging at him like, like a little kid, like, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear this. Stop! Stop the preaching! Stop that! Dashing on him. 
and charging at him with one accord to the end that they cast him out of the city, the preacher, and they stoned him, and witnesses laid down their clothes, you know, because I can't get a good throw when I got this suit on, so I'm going to take this thing off, and then my arm's going to be free, and I'm going to be able to really whip that stone. I'm so angry, right? Ah, oh, stop it, stop it. Why are you talking about me in the sermon? They're whipping stones at the man. Now that the preaching is applicable to themselves, even the heart preaching, even the challenge and application, even the expository preaching, suddenly it's touching me, and suddenly I'm not interested. Suddenly I'm angry. What caused this? Well, first of all, the, the preaching was specific to them. Ye uncircumcised. Ye, right? He, he's, he's, he's dealing directly with the hearts of the, the wicked men that are in the audience. The next thing that they despised was that the preaching revealed the power of God against them. It's not just the power of the preacher. It's the very power of God. And where do you see that? You see that when Stephen looks up into heaven steadfastly and says, I saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That drew up a context from old. That, 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 that spoke to them in a particular way. Now it's not just the preacher. That's God talking. Turn to John chapter 6. And I've seen this. I've seen men that love the preaching of God's word. They say they love hard preaching. They love when the preacher gets up and they're yelling and hollering and pounding the pulpits and getting excited and heated and talking about the sodomites. Right? Because <laughs> I'm not one. It's great. It's awesome. Talking about the adulterers. Yeah, that's awesome. Amen. Talking about the proud. Ooh, hey. Oh, oh, easy. Now you're talking about me. There's nothing more offensive there's nothing that, that carries as much weight to a believer who's got a backslidden heart than the Word of God hard-hitting and personally applied to them. I've seen it. I'm not just talking about the hard-hitting and personal sermon, but when you have it revealed that this was something that was sent particularly to you by God, that's when it really hurts. See, we can all dismiss the preacher's words, right? We can all be like, oh, you know, Brother Josh is up there. He's just, he's just letting loose. He's just picking up. Whatever. He's, he's just a blowhard today. He's just had too many coffees. Whatever. You know, you can, you can dismiss the words of the preacher. But what about when the preacher's words have God revealing himself in them? That's a whole different story. As only God himself could get into a sermon and, and touch you there... When that happens, it's a, it's a frightening position to be in for a, for a backslidden heart. I'm reminded even of, of the sermon that I preached in the early days of the church, for they were afraid. And there, there was a meeting to happen that morning. And, and I, I, I had honestly just believed it would just be business as usual. It would just keep on going. But, but the circumstances of that day were not what I had expected. And yet, when I had studied the sermon out at 4 in the morning before that, it was revealed to me that God knew exactly what was going to happen later on in that day. And in that sermon, for they were afraid, not as if I had planned it, not as if I had known exactly what was going to tr transpire, but God, I found, had a particular purpose for that message. And I saw it with my own eyes, something that I had completely Ne never figured it would apply in the same way. It was, it was personal, practical, and, and, it, and it cut particular people at that time. That was a turning point of our church. That, that was, that was the, the last day that we were in the basement leading into the first week that we were here. And God knew what was going to transpire that day when I was sitting in my room at 4 a.m. writing a message I didn't think could apply to anything. Even standing up there right before I'm going to deliver it and be like, what in the world? This, I don't even know if this message works right now. But it did. The result was great offense and wrath from the preaching of God's word here in the context of Acts chapter 7. I've seen it. And that's a bad reaction. We're talking about challenge accepted. <laughs> 
That, that's a challenge rejected. The challenging of God's word upon somebody. Now another one we have, another bad reaction is John chapter 6. Go there to John chapter 6 and in verse 45. The Bible says, It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Okay, I accept that. That's good. That's good preaching. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. It's a salvation message. This is, this is, this is great. But then Jesus comes out and he says, I am that bread of life. Over in verse 32, Jesus had said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Verse 48, I am that bread of life. I came down unto this earth. I am that true bread. Verse 49 continues, he says, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of this world. So here this, this teaching is received to the men. But the problem is that they received it in the flesh, and so they begin, as we read, to question and to strive against it. Verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? What is he talking about? They, they understood what he was saying, right? They understood the words that were coming out of his mouth. How can he give us... His flesh. He just said, I will give my flesh for the life of this world. And bread is for eating. The flesh is his bread. How is he going to give us his flesh to eat? But after verse 52, Jesus doesn't look, you know, doesn't back up. He doesn't, he doesn't step down. He doesn't, he doesn't stumble to clarify himself, to make this a little bit more plain and understanding for them. He at this moment knows the offense that is about to come out of his mouth. It's going to hit people in particular and, and cause them to be upset. But he's going to speak the truth. Verily. Verse 53 says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the Father, as the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. To clarify what he just said, he says, this is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat men and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Jesus dug in. Jesus didn't lay, you know, hold back. He didn't, he didn't say, okay, I'm going to smooth this message. Or they're not really getting it. He dug in. And not only is he talking about his flesh, he's talking about his blood. He says, you've got to eat it and you've got to drink it. He's talking spiritually. They're receiving it in the flesh. And that's what happens when you have a backslidden heart. You're not in your Bible. You're not praying. You're not walking with Christ. Maybe you're not even saved. That's what happens, right? You are hearing the words, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And you're like, is he some sort of cannibal? What is going on? Because your heart's not ready to receive a spiritual truth that Christ is setting down. And Christ does the same thing through his preachers. He's going to give you something that's going to apply directly to you. And if your heart is not ready to receive it, you're going to receive it as, how can this man give us his flesh? Your, your mind is carnal. 
And you're not receiving spiritual things spiritually. Jesus dug in, and sometimes I get to a point, even when I'm standing up here, where I write a sermon three hours ago, and, and I don't think it's going to apply to anything. But even as I'm standing up here, there's a little thought in my head that goes, uh-oh, this one's going to offend Brother Yuri. Even as the words are about to come out of my mouth. But I can't hold back. I prepared a message, unbeknownst to me, it's going to apply to somebody. There's somebody in this room where as I'm saying the words, I know that they're going to get offended. But it's my responsibility to say the words and to preach the word. There's other people in here that I have no idea that they're taking offense to things that is coming out of my mouth. But as I say it, they're being offended. And if we're being offended by the preaching of God's word, there's something wrong in our heart. God challenges us through preaching. We need to accept the challenge and grow from it. If I should hold off just to not offend specifically someone in the room when I know that it's going to touch them personally, there's been, there's been times I, I, would, I might as well just throw out the sermon, okay? To be fair, I mean, I've, 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 I've given privy information. Some people are going through some things. And sometimes I need to deal with them particularly and head on. But sometimes I have no idea. Either way, the word has to be preached. And if I'm holding back as to not offend somebody, I'm not doing my job. As Jeremiah's ministry was, he was told right off the bat, he was to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. Two third, one third of his ministry was positive. The other two thirds were completely negative. He had to pull he had to root down. He had to destroy. He had to throw down some things before he could build, before he could plant. And this is what preachers do. All right? This is what the Word of God should do. If you're reading with the right heart, the Word of God, as it enters into you, as you're saying, God, give me something this morning. I need to hear from you, from the King James Bible. I need your very words to speak to me right now. He roots out. He pulls down. He destroys. He throws down my own pride, my own ego, my own ideas, my own preconceptions. And only then, once I, all that's been destroyed, can he build, can he plant, can he look forward to something growing out of it. We need to accept challenges when they come to us. But if you look at the result of the preaching that Jesus just made, what do we have in verse 60? Many, therefore, of his disciples, his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is an hard saying, who can hear it? There was strife and there was murmuring. This was a bad reaction to the challenge that God's word just sent forth. Verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, I'm sorry. Let me, let me rephrase this. Did he say that? No. Doth this offend you? <laughs> what and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? He's almost like, if this offends you, what and if you see Christ rise from the dead? It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. This is the whole point of his message here. He's like, the spirit will quicken it. The spiritual meat, the spiritual blood, the spiritual bread. This is what gives life. The flesh will profit you nothing. And when we receive the challenge from the word of God and accept it carnally, and we accept it in the flesh, it profits us nothing. The words that I speak unto you, he continues, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given him, given unto him of my Father. The reaction of murmuring, the reaction of, of disputing, of strife that comes from the hearing of God's word is the wrong one. Jesus is saying, you've got to receive this spiritually. You can't be backslidden in heart. You can't be a lost person and expect to get what I'm saying to you right now. Even the disciples are like, this is a hard saying. He's offending me. And what was the result? Verse 66. 
from that time, literally from the moment that this preaching came out, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Jesus is giving them a spiritual truth. They received it in the flesh. They got offended, and they're like, I'm out. I'm done. I'm not walking with this guy anymore. I can't receive this. I'm going back. Where are they going back? They're backsliding to the life that they had before. They're backsliding to the friends that they had before. They're backsliding to the, the family that they were around before. They're backsliding to the old life. They went back and they walked no more with him. The challenge went forward. Hey, hey, receive me. Eat my meat. Eat the bread. Drink my blood. <laughs> receive what I'm teaching you. Receive the preaching. They didn't accept the challenge. The right reaction, turn to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. <clears throat> they didn't receive the challenge that was set forth. God came and he tried to reach them. He tried to touch them. Even as the Pharisees of old tried to say, hey, you're stiff-necked. You're hard-hearted. You're backslidden. After Daniel, have Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. But God challenges us through reading, through learning, through the preaching, through the teaching of God's Word. And when God sends a challenge our way, our responsibility is to accept the challenge. To accept the challenges that come from God's word, from a loving God that wants you to do right, wants to be your father, wants you to be his child, that wants you to do right. From a loving preacher that wants to just portray God's message and, and have the same end. When you hear the challenge, we need to put away our pride. We need to understand that the preacher, and by extension, the, the very Lord of heaven, is just trying to help you and not trying to hurt you. So the challenge comes forth, accept it. Jonah chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Remember, Jonah had refused to bring the word the first time. He got in a lot of trouble over that. <laughs> I don't want to refuse to bring the, God, the Word of God and get in a lot of trouble for it, right? I got, a, I got an example going before me. Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The word of the Lord to the preacher, he was to bring the message, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be des destroyed. It shall be overthrown. It shall be in destruction, in ruin. He brought that negative sermon. He brought it just as God wanted him to do. It was personal, it was applicable, and it was hard preaching. It's all the things that we say we like until it's directed at us, right? Was there more said in this sermon? Was, was that just the title? You know, if you put it on YouTube, would the title be, Yet 40 Days, and then of us shall be overthrown? And there was more to that message? I don't know. Did he just come and cry that, and, and that very word of God was penetrating and powerful enough to convince these people to repent in sackcloth and ashes? I don't know. But either way, it was effective. Whatever he said, even from a preacher that we find out later had some bad motives to it, right? <laughs> he brought the word of God, and later on in, in chapter 4 and verse 4, he, 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 the Lord asked him, Dost thou well to be angry? <laughs> he was angry at what happened, at the response of the people. But either way, the word of God went forth, and the people responded, I believe, appropriately. And we can learn a lot from how the people of Nineveh responded to the preaching of the word of God. Verse 5 says, so the people of Nineveh believed God, imagine that, and proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them even unto the least of them. 
For the word for word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not the result from the people hearing the challenge the challenge was accepted they turned to God with fasting with humility with literally crying out unto him mightily even the animals were fasting at that time don't even feed the goldfish right we're all in one united front praising God and begging for him to have mercy why because who can tell if God will turn and repent. You see how they believe that? Like, who can tell if he will turn? They, they literally believed that even if they did fast, God wasn't going to. They, they, were, they were set. It was established in their minds. And some people might think, well, if i got 40 days left, I'm just going to cause a ruckus. I'm just going to party. Woo! Whip it up, right? But no, these are like, we will spend the next 40 days fasting if it will appease God. If it will get his wrath off of our backs. We could save our hides if God will repent, change his mind about destroying us. Who can tell if it would be so? But let's try to get his anger off of us. Let's try to be released from his fierce wrath. And then the Bible comes and is preached from the pulpit. The word of God comes to your ears. And we respond similarly to the Pharisees. Maybe we have strife. Maybe we have murmuring. What we need is a lot more repentance, sackcloth, and ashes just pouring ourselves out to God and being like God I was wrong you you came to me and you said hey yet 40 days and I shall be overthrown yet 40 days and my family shall be overthrown yet 40 days and I got this and this and this to get right God please the people of Nineveh turned from their evil way they repented of their sins and God's response to this whole city they had the right response, and the result was in verse 10. God saw their works, their works being that they repented of their sins, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. So when the people were convinced by the scriptures, where they're convinced by the word of God. When the challenge went forth, they accepted it and they received mercy and they received grace from God because of it. And yet we know that the result of the bad response was that the Lord just doubled down in the preaching, didn't he? <laughs> don't, don't, don't be surprised when, when you know Brother Josh just touches on something that is maybe in your life a problem and you double down. And God responds as, you know, as the Lord did in his preaching. And the next week, he gives something to Brother Josh that he brings, maybe unbeknownst to him, and it's a, it's a little bit firmer. <laughs> he, the Lord doubles down in the message to you. Hey, get this right. We don't want that response from God where he's just got to double down and dig deeper. And then week after week after week, you're being hurt. If you've got, you got a heart that's hardened towards God, a couple weeks of the Lord preaching against you, you'll be out. You'll quit. You gotta have soft hearts. The next thing that, that a bad response brought from the Lord was that the Lord revealed and exposed more and more of our wickedness. He, he, he just brought it to the surface. He brought it to the light. And that's that's what I've seen. Where where people that were were good, godly Christians, they got a heart that started to turn from God. Suddenly, the preaching's feeling more personal. It's it's hitting them where it hurts. And then God just keeps ramping it up and ramping it up and ramping it up in their lives. And next thing you know, the truth about these people is being revealed. Suddenly their attitude shifts. Suddenly they're exposing themselves for the, the wickedness in their own hearts. And then next thing you know, they're out of church. Next thing you know, they're back in the world. They're, 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 just, they're just doing all the things that they used to do. And it all started from one decision that when the challenge came, they did not accept it. But they rejected the word of God. 
We need to receive the word with the right response. There's a challenge, accept it. There's a challenge, accept it. Every single time you read your Bible, every single time you hear it preached, accept the challenge. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, another group. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. The purpose of God challenging our hearts with hard preaching, with hard messages, with spiritual truths that, that dig deep, that go a little bit a little bit deeper than we're used to. They're not something that the fleshly mind, the carnal mind is going to understand. The reason for these things is revealed in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. It says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So the purpose of the preaching, hard preaching particularly, and personal preaching that God brings through man quite often or through your reading, the purpose is that you would be cleansed and perfect in holiness. You would be complete in the holiness that God wants you to be complete in. You need to receive the challenge, accept it, and grow. Accept it and go forward. Verse 2 says, receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you. For I have said before that you're in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. And I trust that I have the same spirit. I desire to have the same spirit as the Apostle Paul here. Where he comes and when he brings the bold sermon, the bold letter, he doesn't do it to condemn his people, his audience. He doesn't do it to bring them down. He says, great is my boldness of speech to you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in our tribulation. He's laboring with them. He's going through the troubles with them. When the Apostle Paul brought the message that was bold and hard hitting, when he brought the challenge, he didn't do it to destroy. He do it, did it to the end that they would be built up and they would be planted. He is with them in that. He is hurting them with that. He's hurting with them in those things. It's not for condemnation, but the end is of comfort. And the Corinthian church that he was writing to, here he's reflecting on what had happened. That church was carnal. That church was fornicating. That church was idolatrous. That church was a very proud and puffed up church. They thought they knew it all. They thought they had it all. They thought they were in need of nothing, right? But this church needed to be taken down a few notches. And that's why in 1 Corinthians, he brought such a bold writing to them. He brought bold speech toward them in order that... He could have joy of the same in the end. Paul reflects on his firm dealings and his challenge to them. In verse 8 he says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were for but a season. And sometimes after hearing the preaching on a Sunday, you go home and you feel a little sorry. And you know what? To be honest, I have a little bit of the attitude that the Apostle Paul has, especially when I know that I've touched on somebody, uh, something that somebody is sensitive in, some, some sin that somebody has in their life, some struggle that has, somebody has in their life. He says, I do not repent, though I made you sorry with the sermon. He says, I do not repent, though I did repent. You've got to go back and forth in your mind. But the sorrow that happens here, the sorrow that comes to their hearts, it was but for a season, and so sometimes we go home on a Sunday and we feel a little sorryful. We feel a little uncomfortable after what we had heard. But the right response is highlighted in what we've received here. Verse 9 says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. Okay? So that's the purpose in the end of God's preaching, right? The sorrow unto repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damaged by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. What's the Apostle Paul saying here? He's like, my letter made you sorry, but it was after a godly manner. In other words, that sorrow brought you to repentance, 
not to be repented of. He brought you to repentance that brought the salvation for your situation, the salvation from your struggles, the salvation from your sin at that time. In other words, they were struggling with the problem of fornication, and then the message came and said, hey, you don't fornicate, it's wicked, it's wrong, and the sorrow of that experience brought them to repentance, which brought them from salvation from the fornication, if that makes sense. The sorrow of this world is to the contrary, and that's the one that bringeth death. And that's what happens, the sorrow of this world, when somebody has the heart that is not ready to receive the word, not ready to receive the scripture spiritually, and they end up being full of the sorrow of the world, and they end up like those disciples who went back and followed him no more. They just gave up. They just quit. They were like, I'm done. I can't hear this message. I can't hear week after week that my sins are wrong and they're ruining my life. I can't hear that. I can't hear these challenges. We need to rather, though, sorrow unto repentance, challenge accepted. Verse 11 says, Behold this same self thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sword. And this is what happens. This is what should happen. When you sorrow after a godly sword, after hearing preaching that applies to you, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what, what clearing of yourself. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. And all these things you have proved yourself to be clear in this matter. They were saved from the matter that was troubling them, that was plaguing them. And when they heard the preaching, they accepted it. They got it right. They felt sorry after the godly sword unto repentance. Next thing you know, they're being careful. They're clearing themselves. With indignation, they're getting this stuff out of their lives. With a fear of God and a vehement desire and a zeal, abundantly, they are approving themselves to be clear in this matter. And that's what needs to happen to rightly receive the word of God when it comes to you. The result is, and what my desire is, is as verse 12. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did not for this cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. I want the care of you before God to be evident when the preaching comes forward. Therefore, verse 13, we were comforted in your comfort, yea, exceeding the more joy when we, for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. And in the end, I rejoiced in verse 16, therefore, and have confidence in you all in all things. I get comfort, I get joy when I see God's people doing right. <laughs> when I see God's people hearing the Bible, and then, and then next week, they're, they're telling me with joy that they've, they've made great leaps and bounds in certain areas. Like the Bible reports here, you made yourself clear in this matter. The best thing that I can ever hear is, hey, Brother Josh, that, that sermon really helped me with this, and now I've gotten this clear. Now I've gotten this right. We're getting more towards what God wants us. Hey, I'm not trying to just make you sorry. When I make you sorry, sometimes I feel sorry. But the reality is, is I need to just put it out there the best way I can, as, as, as clear as I can, and let the Word of God do the work. So that when the challenge comes forth, the Christian with the right heart would just accept the challenge, get right, have that same sorrow after a godly sort, carefulness, clearing, indignation, vehement desire towards God, and a zeal that revenges all those sins. You know, it just gets them out and destroys them best you can. That's the purpose of the challenges that God sets forth. Don't be like the Pharisees. That when the challenge comes from the Bible, when suddenly it's, it's applied to you and practical, you get all angry. you got to be like these of Corinth, these of Nineveh that heard the word, believed God, and repented. Just got it right. Just got it right. That, that, that's the easiest thing we can do. Hey, even if it's something that's a besetting sin, you have trouble getting it right, at least if you have the vehement desire that every week you say, hey, God, I want to get this right. Hey, God, I want to get this right. I, and, and you're repenting in the heart, even though you still may have that besetting sin challenging you. That's what God wants to see. If there first be a willing mind, a heart that's desiring towards him, is accepted with him, and God's going to do great things with those things. But the last thing that we want to do as Christians is hear a truth and just... La, 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 and try to ignore it, right? Amen. We need to be ready to hear God's word and to respond appropriately to it. And I hope this was a challenge to you, and it will be a challenge accepted. Thank you, Father.